Madame la Ministre, Panie Ministrze. Minister. Professors and dear students of the College of Europe and colleagues, dear friends. It is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome all of you today at the Naturin campus of the College of Europe. It is also a great honor for the College of Europe in Natalin to host a debate between two ministers from two countries, Poland and France, responsible for European affairs. Today's debate on Europe, on European integration and the future of this process, so dear for us here at the College, so important for us here at the College, and so important to everything what we have been doing here at Natalin for almost 30 years, with students and for students. This year we are very proud to have 137 students coming from 40 nationalities who can truly experience Europe here as a whole with the joys and challenges of living in complex community of many cultures and outlooks. Madame la Ministre, bienvenue à Natalie. Welcome, Minister, and thank you for accepting our invitations to, to this debate uh, on the future of the European Union. This for us is a great pleasure and honor to be able to host you here today. Minister, it is with great joy that I welcome you and thank you for accepting our invitation. It is a great honor. Be conducted by Mr. Grzegorz Dobiecki, whom I would like to thank for agreeing to moderate the debate on the future of the European Union. Mr. Grzegorz Dobiecki is a Polish journalist and was for many years chief correspondent in France for some of the leading Polish media outlets, currently host of a dedicated expert program on international affairs to był dzień na świecie at the Polsat News TV channel. And so, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, with, without further ado, I would like to wish all of you good and constructive discussions, and now I am giving the floor to, to you, Grzegorz. Thank you very much. Madame la Ministre, bonjour. Panie Ministrze, dzień dobry. Good afternoon, Minister. When the, so I will be asking questions in French, and I will be asking questions to the Minister in Polish. Since this is a meeting for students predominantly and for the diplomatic corps, we would like to ask journalists not to ask questions later. There will be a press conference afterwards that will be dedicated for that purpose. Um, Madam Minister, welcome. First of all, in Poland, at the heart of uh, Poland, on the Polish ground, so here, in a country which is a friend. The bilateral relation we will not talk about, perhaps. We will talk about that later, but in the framework of the European re relations. I'd like us to separate two things, the current status quo, when there are two different people are looking at the same, uh, but do not necessarily see the same thing. So how do you perceive Europe at the moment? And first of all, I'd like to Welcome, everyone, and I'd like to thank everyone for being able to meet here and talk about Europe. Let's start with the current situation. <coughs> Europe today faces the challenges, the challenges that don't know borders. I'm talking about the climate change challenges. I'm talking about the last Katowice uh, climate summit. Uh, I'm talking about mi migratory challenges and also the challenges 
uh, preparing us for the digital revolution and uh, of course of course the challenges of defense and security all those matters are not limited by borders and the responses have to be worked out by multiple european states at the same time, European Union was never so much attacked as it is today, both from outside and internally. On the outside, we have states or groups of states which have a negative point of view on Europe, which see Europe negatively and start tend to weaken it instead of um, reinforcing it. Maybe in Poland more than anywhere, we know about Russia and its nostalgia, nostalgic um, about the past. They sometimes live with this nostalgic um, attitude and uh, they are talking about rejoining the European Union. They, uh, the spread of the European Union is seen by Russians as something negative. Currently in the United States, we are dealing with an administration which already said different uh, negative things about Europe. They said that Europe is their hostile enemy. For sure, this is too strong um, a word which doesn't reflect our mutual relations, but it is a signal. It is a signal for us that the power of the European Union is seen outside, not always as something positive. As we speak about internal affairs, we have been uh, struck by different terrorist attacks, especially France. So we can talk in general about this political violence, and I take, take it with great sadness. Uh, with the great sadness, I learned about the murder of Paweł Adamowicz, the mayor of Gdańsk. So the terrorism rejection of the current political uh, system, different um, faces of the populism for which European construction is something hostile. The, these are other challenges. We tend to forget that the European Union is the very organism which provided us with tens of years of prosperity and peace, thanks to which this common area of freedom was created, of freedom, of social um, safety, and of entrepreneurship. This is exactly European Union, and those who want to challenge the European project they can present themselves as candidates in elections, and they tend to weaken Europe and even destroy the European project at all. Another challenge is a withdrawal of one of the states European, uh, from the European Union. On the 29th of March, the uh, United Kingdom is leaving us. We don't know exactly, we don't understand where this uh, state is heading at. So this is another challenge for the European Union, and this is also something that strengthens this need to cooperate, not to uh, be complacent, not to uh, be um, not to agree to the status quo. Minister, your assessment of the situation in Europe will be a sort of a response to what Madam um, Minister Loiseau has just said. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you, Madam Rector, for inviting us here, and thank you for such a great turnout. Uh, and uh, thank you, Natalie, for the uh, long consultations that we've had today so far. We've been able to uh, make reference to uh, the most important issues uh, for Paris and Warsaw alike to uh, quite some good extent. And at the heart of these issues, not just because we are ministers for European affairs, has been integration. Uh, for sure. And I think it's worth uh, looking at why this is the case, that uh, in every capital of the EU at this point, we are talking about the future of the European Union, how we are supposed to overcome the crises, how we are supposed to reform our unprecedented cooperation uh, within the EU. And I think it's important to uh, 
remark that we talk about it because we really do care about it very much. We wouldn't be spending so much time, and I'm talking about all the capitals, but predominantly Paris and Warsaw today, talking to one another about EU affairs if we didn't really care about the EU. Both Paris and Warsaw definitely care about the EU, and that's why we are looking for the best solutions that could either limit the uh, costs of such crisis situations as Brexit, where uh, most likely you can't find any advantages. You can only limit the damages, the costs, or in such situations that we are seeing uh, from the point of view of uh, lack of convergence in the Eurozone. Um, and the variety and lack of conversion about migration on various axes of the European Union and how to um, be able to overcome such uh, obstacles so that uh, citizens can be offered not only an understandable and safe future, but also so that the EU can once again become the obvious added value for all of our states, so that the EU may become the obvious support for constructing the welfare of our states, of our citizens, of our economy, so that it can become the added value for European security, which is in fact being threatened at the moment. Both, in fact, aspects, so the main uh, premise of um, politics as such, so securing welfare and security are n being questioned at the moment, and that is unprecedented right now. Various political uh, forces, actually, powers, are drawing varying conclusions from that. Um, I think that the function of polit politics is to manage differences uh, competently to create competently such solutions where everyone can feel equally comfortable. In my view, the most important subject to be um, faced uh, in Europe, both by the left and by the right, by all the, in fact, powers that are attached to the European project, is to reinstate uh, here in Europe uh, its full legitimacy. A feeling of being in control, you know, that citizens are, are in control. The lack of trust both on the left and on the right-hand side of the political arena is the growing uh, feeling of alienation, the, the feeling that decisions are being made without our opinions taking into account, and those are opinions of both citizens, communities, but also groups and member states, whether we believe it's true or not. This, in fact, undermines the very foundations of trust. And I think this is, the, this is, this is a task that's seen everywhere. We need to reinstate that feeling of being in control, not just so that we can exit the EU or um, eliminate it just as it happened in the e in the UK, right, because they wanted to exit for that purpose, but to give states and citizens back the sense of being so that, again, everybody can feel at home in the EU so that they can get rid of any doubts as to whether or not the EU is serving their interests. Poland, Warsaw is in this comfortable situation that um, we, I think, are among the minority of EU states where we are no longer experiencing such doubts. Uh, there are no doubts in Poland anymore as to the fact that the EU is playing a positive role for the development of the guarantees of our welfare. And um, there are no doubts that Europe could be doing even more uh, as far as guaranteeing our security is concerned. But our concern is that there are more and more capitals where the popular elections are an, a great question mark for the future of the European project. And that's a concern for us all, because distortion of that process in one country for such an EU triggers distortions somewhere else. And it is not neutral for Warsaw um, how the stability is doing, because this European process, this stability is a very important dimension of our welfare. and. Uh, what's even potentially more important and more key 
uh, is our security. And that's task number one, to reinstate that feeling of being in control over that process, not just to stop it, quite the opposite, so that it can then inspire trust. And as far as two main axes are concerned, where the uh, narrative uh, construct is constructed around the east, west, south, and north, um, sometimes uh, they are quite spectacular from the point of view of the rhetoric. Uh, what I mean are the tensions between East and West are n not particularly significant for the future of the project because with Eastern Central Europe is in fact full of support for the European project and it's also uh, the cradle of economic development. We are integrated ec economies in terms of trade. We are offering opportunities to our trade partners. Polish growth is a positive uh, outcome for many other countries and what's important ultimately Central European states are countries of not just relative but objective political stability. The only thing that has uh, in fact uncovered quite an important difference of opinions, not just in rhetoric, but in terms of facts, is the attitude to the migration crisis. For obvious reasons, our uh, part of Europe has never had such migratory experiences as have been as has have been visible in the uh, Mediterranean countries. And m what's more, our part of Europe is not certain as to whether the migration policy that some states practice in the EU is uh, totally predictable. Before our eyes here, uh, things are happening that are contrary to the forecasts uh, that should not be happening. And this is a fundamental reason which causes us to try and look for different solutions for this case. But I would be cautious uh, when uh, attaching too big an importance to this issue, because that only refers to a very narrow uh, aspect of the internal uh, security policy and all the other areas, cooperation with third states, uh, investments in North Africa, uh, reinforcing border controls based on either national or community, more importantly, um, regulations. The uh, Europe, Central Europe is part of the solution, not the crisis. We have made it evident over the last few months that we can join certain shared uh, initiatives, even though we are not directly affected by the crisis, we are affected indirectly because we consider it a European crisis. Minister, uh, please let's uh, watch the time. The ownership uh, of integration, I mentioned how I see it. This is quite colorful in terms of rhetoric, not so intense in terms of a policy uh, that's the tensions between east and west and now the tensions between south and uh, north uh, here where is where i think we can see the most serious limitations in terms of trying to uh, overcome the crisis where uh, that uh, some of, part of the Eurozone has been affected with. I think here lie the deepest imbalances in terms of the capacity of states and central banks and societies, uh, capacities of being able to manage the differences. We have uh, some countries that are unable to manage their public debt, but on the other hand, some of them have a budget surplus. So here lies the border of European in integration in such areas as fiscal convergence, the budget of the EU zone, institutional areas, or even such modest instruments as the bank union, which cannot uh, come to fruition, not because of Central Europe. In all the areas that I've listed, Euro Central Europe plays a positive constructive role, which is seen by observing the uh, December um, Eurogroup uh, s uh, meetings uh, in an inclusive model where we took into account the convergence and stability uh, instrument for the Eurozone. Uh, there is no strategic tension here, I think. It lies somewhere else. Uh, it does not directly affect uh, a great majority of Central European states, but it's also a concern for us, too. We're not suggesting that somebody else's ideas, every but all problems in the European Union are problems for us all, but it's a question of how we uh, how we see our role. Let me let me interrupt you don't to, not to forget about our guests. Madam uh, Minister, we would like the responses to be the time for responses to be equally long for both of you. Uh, there was uh, 
Men, Minister mentioned your Central Europe. How do you see the initiatives in this, in this part of Europe? I'm talking about the Visegrad uh, group or the three, um, three C initiative. How this smaller format, this smallest uh, format of cooperation, how do you see it all in the context of the in, uh, Elysian uh, Treaty. That is true that in uh, Central Europe there are in, in Europe there are a lot of formats that allow us to know each other better. To the, the, the Visegrad uh, group is a very interesting group from this perspective. President Macron had uh, several occasions to meet the representatives of uh, this group, of Visegrad group, not all of them, all of them, yes, and on several occasions, the leaders of the Visegrad group, especially two prime ministers of Poland. We have to give the value to those this kind of formats because they increase the possibilities of dialogue. These are not blocks of countries. Uh, there are some differences between those, uh, those blocks. Uh, just like in a family, for example, in the Visegrad group, we had uh, to do with this kind of differences when we dealt with the um, labor uh, law especially the transport providers, there were some differences. Poland was enthusiastic about uh, that. Uh, you mentioned uh, the Treaty of Aachen uh, as a complement to the Treaty on the European Union. Uh, this is also about the um, role of France and Germany in the Europe. I know that this axis, French, Franco-German axis, is sometimes criticized. It is so if something is wrong. When France and Germany are not cooperating um, about a reform, everything is stuck uh, and it can be changed. We have to adapt to the reality that is changing, to the States that are changing. Poland now is com a completely different state that in, that in use, that, than it used to be in 2004. France as well is different than the one that created the European Union. So we have to adapt, and the European Union has to adapt to this, those differences. That's why we need France and Germany, who keep close bilateral relations. European Union was built thanks to the reunification of those two countries. Both France and Germany want to offer additional developments for other countries of the European Union. This is what the Treaty of Aachen is about. It is about different bilateral solutions, but it also mentions uh, the Security Council and the interests of European Union in the United Nations Security Council. France is the permanent member of this uh, arena. United Kingdom used to be, but it is now uh, exiting the European Union. Poland and Germany also have their say in the, in the Security Council. So there are a lot of voices representing European Union that can be heard when they talk about the peace in the world, but it needs to be coordinated. I am ready to accept all the different formats of cooperation. I can mention one more, the Weimar Triangle. And if we only can fill those meetings, those cooperation um, for us with content, we are always very eager to participate. This is important for those formats not to be closed to other players. Other actors, none of those formats have exclusive exclu exclusivity on having on being right. We are a family. We have similarities among us, but also things that uh, that differentiate us. When you mentioned, when Minister mentioned migration, that's true. We didn't choose the same way to look for solution. But in the June summit, 
all the countries agreed for a strategy in the field of migration. Minister Szymański mentioned the need to uh, tighten the uh, borders. The Frontex agency has its seat in Warsaw. I'm going there tomorrow to, to pay a visit. And it is very important also what is happening in the European Union, how the reformed asylum policy is uh, shaped, how we uh, reform the documents on this uh, regard. We agree that all those texts, all those documents have to be developed together in a coherent way, in a solidarity. Solidarity is a notion that was taught to us by Poland in some time in, in, in the history. European Union is living thanks to solidarity and thanks to how this solidarity is realized in life. It, can, it can be realized in different ways, but we have to find uh, room for it. Referring to those bilateral uh, relations, uh, today we are celebrating the 200th anniversary of diplomatic relations between France and Poland. We notice recently uh, some kind of shutdown in those uh, two-party relations. Is it going to change uh, in the weeks or months to come? I wouldn't use this term, shutdown. I think it's an exa exaggeration. Poland-France relations, they don't come to the expectations of, bon of both nations. We have common history. We have been friends for years. Uh, but we also have some harsh words to say. We have to be critical to our histories. Some things were neglected, some things were not done. I came to Poland not only to talk with Minister Szymański. I'm meeting him in Brussels and Luxembourg regular on a regular basis, but we are I'm here to prepare the visit of uh, President Macron to Poland. He is coming in the first uh, semester of this year, not only because this is the 100th anniversary of uh, our diplomatic um, relations and of the uh, Versal uh, Treaty. This young captain uh, came to 100 years ago to, to help you fight the Soviets. So this is uh, an extraordinary year, so that's why I hope that we will come up to the expectations. Better days are coming, as we've heard from the French minister. Yes, definitely, better days are definitely coming. I agree that the word shutdown is not adequate. If there was a shutdown, we would not be having the pleasure today of sitting here together and uh, uh, sharing opinions that are important for both uh, our capitals. What we can certainly say is that today we have made a lot of progress and a big step forward to make sure that these bilateral and trilateral relations have this necessary content, because I fully agree that, especially in uh, European conditions, uh, pointless visits are pointless and uh, they should not just have a decorative character. And I think here together we have made a significant step towards making these relations and visits uh, full of content. And there are a few words that I'd like to say about formats in the EU, more long-lasting forms of cooperation. Very often they are attributed various uh, intentions or roles which are not fully justified. And what I can say, first of all, is that each of these formats is an open-ended one. We're not complaining. Uh, and uh, upon a deficit in terms of contacts with uh, Berlin or Paris as the Visegrad group, I think the communication between us is very, very good. Quite soon, and as soon as February, we'll be seeing uh, another session with uh, Chancellor Merkel, the Prime Minister of Prime Ministers. So there is no threat of decomposing the EU with such formats. I think that such formats within the Union of 28 are helpful for shaping uh, joint decisions and making it more easy, easier to shape them. And the Visegrad group, perhaps unexpectedly, um, 
has today become the best organized regional format uh, when it comes to the level of detail of various coordination, coordinated initiatives. Of course, there are no states of the EU that are equal, so it should not be understood as a full equivalence of purposes um, and motivations, but this is the best organized uh, regional group for sure. And the dialogue, the French-German dialogue, uh, which uh, was then uh, made uh, um, evidence with the Treaty of Aachen, then is existential, and I don't think it should be perceived as, in a, as a category of threat or problem. It should not be done taking into account the fact that such documents as uh, Messelberg Declaration or the Treaty are showing us the borders or the limitations, uh, definitely the, the boundaries of the joint agenda of these two great um, capitals that are at the same time able to formulate uh, future plans with all the surrounding nations, especially neighboring nations. But the most important thing about it is the, the fact that both Paris and Warsaw are aware that regardless of how many formats we have and how much they are attached to their own convictions on various matters and the future of Europe, uh, the reform of the European Union and overcoming the crises that we're uh, facing today is only possible if we do it together. I think we're fully aware of that, all of us. None of the formats that we have, even which, if it's historically very important, is capable of deciding today how EU 28 may uh, overcome difficulties. I would not uh, strike on a very dramatic note here. Uh, but the difficulties that we are facing, shall we say. So those capitals that are determined to overcome difficulties need to have a very un intense dialogue. And at the end of that pathway is something that is paramount to Warsaw, is to maintain the unity of Europe. And it's not just decorative uh, value of that unity. Of course, it sounds good. Unity is a good word for politics. It is the uh, condition for strength, for power, but it also has a fundamental meaning for the European interest. An EU that is divided only means a weaker Europe. It would mean that our commercial interests would be uh, protected in a, in a weaker way and that our socio-economical model that we want to protect and develop and that is under pressure for global reasons would not be protected to such a great extent. Also, our security will not be protected to um, a great extent without that. So it would be completely pointless. European treaties and European practice assures, uh, ensures a lot of flexibility in this project and a lot of flexibility for such states that want to do something more in some areas. There's nothing wrong with that. But a division uh, of the European Union, whatever cryptonym it has, it would be a bad idea not just for Warsaw or for Tallinn. It would be a bad idea for Europe as such, uh, because that would mean that at the end of the day and at the end of the tensions that, uh, that are visible and that are global would exit weaker. And we don't want that. We want Europe to be effective. We want it to effectively add to the protection of our interests, and we can only do it together to the extent possible, of course, because the politics is never fully homogeneous, especially in Europe. Uh, the, uh, it doesn't make sense uh, to come back to it, but we can only do it together. Thank you very much, Minister. It's together. The la politique extérieure. If we are talking about the external relations, uh, common policy of external, uh, common external policy, there a question is raised whether this common policy has any, has even been defined. As for the reaction to the Maduro's, uh, Maduro president of Venezuela, we have seen that this reaction of the European states was um, strong, was powerful, but not decisive. The external relations, transatlantic relations, the question how to react, how to respond to Iran and everything that is happening around this matter, our common external policy, what about it? Yes, indeed, there are many issues. Uh, in this matter. Uh, 
any time that we uh, want to solve a problem, we want to act uh, for an external partner, we tend to find a common solution to strengthen our position in the international arena. I want uh, these consultations to be systematic. To, I want all those difficult uh, subjects, whether it is the Middle East or the, the peace process. We always know what the parameters of this uh, restoring the peace uh, in the Middle East are. We don't have to invent anything. Uh, good that could bring anything anything good for neither for the Middle East nor for the European Union. As for Iran, there are three states in Europe, Germany, United Kingdom and France, who thought, who have been thinking for many years that it will be possible to have a situation where Iran will comply with uh, their um, involvement, not to spread the um, the weapons, it needed time, it had to be accepted, and it succeeded. An agreement on um, atomic weapons was uh, signed, and Iran complied with it. But United States withdrew from the agreement. We believe that it was a mistake. This withdrawal was a mistake when we don't suggest anything uh, to replace it. I believe that this agreement with Iran maybe is not sufficient. There are other worries concerning the Iran's behavior and position, especially about the um, ballistic um, missiles or their role in the Middle East. That is clear. Those matters are also to be discussed with Iran. But as the uh, spreading of the atomic weapons, the agreement here used to work, used to be effective. And the international um, agency, uh, atomic agency, con will, would confirm it. So as long as this agreement is uh, respected, our obligation and our responsibility is to maintain it. That is why we take care about transferring to the to Iran what we are what we have to say whenever some uh, misunderstandings appear. But we want to maintain this um, this agreement. When you mentioned Iran, I would like to refer to the conference that is going to be held in Warsaw. I believe I answered to, to that. The expectations concerning Iran and the Middle East and the atomic weapons, we always can talk about Iran. Sometimes it is a pity to talk about them without them. But anytime we talk about Iran, we have to have in mind the behavior, the, the, the keeping, the maintain, man, man, maintaining of this agreement. As for Venezuela, here the reaction was maybe a bit timid, but it was a, a powerful uh, response. The situation in the European Union is very um, versatile now, but what is happening in Venezuela is a drama. Civic peoples, people are a hostage of uh, of the authorities. The regime is shooting at their own people. So the political situation is a very complex one. Our first reaction, first reaction of uh, Commissioner Mogherini, uh, we heard it of uh, Mr. Sanchez and Mr. Macron and other European leaders who stated that they are for free uh, democratic elections in Venezuela. On this occasion, European states will have to think who it can be uh, believed to, to be the authority or the ruling um, party in Venezuela. This is important. I'm not talking about intervening there, but I'm stressing that the situation there is a dramatic one. Another part of the question, perhaps I will ask the minister here about transatlantic relationships. 
Let me quote the words of um, Prime Minister Morawiecki um, issued quite recently about Poland, which, according to him, is one of the few, perhaps the only, states in the EU that is both pro-European and pro-American. Well, some will be uh, trying to find a discrepancy between though, uh, those terms. Let's hope there isn't any, because uh, the stake of our security is to maintain not just the unity of the European Union on that matter, which is still not playing uh, a crucial role in issues of security, but uh, what's at stake here is to keep the unity of the West, which is a greater political notion than just the European Union. This uh, unity has never been optimal, never been perfect, but I think it's in the interest of uh, the bordering countries to, first of all, not add any problems to the issue of uh, Western unity, as traditionally understood, and also to uh, make sure that we maintain the existing elements, especially in an unfavorable condition when we're facing the threat of a trade conflict with the United States, when we're still looking at uh, uh, variable uh, approaches to the key security issues th throughout the world. I'd like to um, point out that even the EU is not maintaining a fully com uh, community policy in the Middle East. And in that region, Natalie said that from the beginning of the Syrian war, uh, the key role has been played by the coalition of, of the volunteering uh, states, which decided that this was the right time, the right moment to play their own role and their own agenda and uh, use their own flag. And I think that one of the few aspects of the community policy towards the region was uh, a memorandum of understanding on the development of the nuclear program by Iran. And there are no tensions here. Poland supports the EU mandate in that area and supports the maintenance of that memorandum of understanding. We do not see any reason to weaken it, contrary to Washington, which has decided that it does not really gives us any, give us any warranty and that it does not eliminate the threats that the Iranian nuclear programs and other threats of Iran in the region carries for carry for the security of the whole um, surrounding uh, area. And these are justified conclusions. You may view situation like that, but uh, we came to the conclusion that the memorandum of understanding should be kept. Uh, but in the name of the unity of the West, we would like to point out one thing. Uh, we want the European Union to acknowledge the American diagnosis, and we would not like it to uh, put forward any sanctions, because that puts us in an ambiguous uh, position. We understand the difference of opinion, but we should not uh, tread that road further. What's important from the point of view of external policy and security policy for Warsaw is definitely to uh, nurture the feeling of unity, of fate, especially when it comes to the security of the West, which is a wider notion than the European Union. Our security uh, has a shared context, and we should not be too quick uh, to make to jump to conclusions uh, and uh, try and uh, excessively uh, differentiate uh, between certain strategic notions. This happens anyway, and it's harmful for our security. We should not really add to that uh, discourse. That's why Warsaw. Coming from the premise that Europe could do be, could be doing more in the areas of security, has agreed to develop the security policy, both from the point of view of financing, research and development, but also a direct cooperation, and is uh, developing uh, its presence uh, within those programs. But we would like to emphasize one thing that potential new opening, new chapter in security policy cannot be done at the cost of synergy with NATO, the USA and the world of the West. Um, bluntly speaking, our resources are limited. Therefore, we need to invest them in such a way so that they are adherent to the common backbone of the joint security. Sometimes it may be controversial, but we will be cautious of uh, treading that path, because you can deal with the trade conflict, but um, um, 
a developing strategic convergence can be bring costs that are costly for us. Also, on the note of security, ener energy security and cyber security, uh, it's impossible not to mention the potential or realistic threats uh, from Russia. Uh, we have spoken uh, quite a lot about this uh, from various uh, points of view. It is a problem that's already today a powerful experience in France after the recent elections. It's a problem that is still perhaps a little bit more distant from Warsaw. We have not yet seen a spectacular interference in an election process and um, a strike uh, against the uh, democratic system in Poland here. But we cannot feel fully secure because that will also come. One thing is uh, certain. Russia has an interest in destabilizing uh, the um, European uh, stability, whether that's the stability of the EU or any other organization. Russia is not interested in just being a partner of the of Europe. Uh, it would not have to then interfere. It is interested in the West being weakened, quite simply. And that is a worry of many EU member states. But it's also a valid reason to be developing actions on the EU level that are aimed at increasing our resilience uh, to such cybersecurity threats and such disinformation threats. Uh, and upon that note, we have had some progress there, therein on the EU level. I think Paris and Warsaw are among the capitals that are in fact advocating for uh, making Europe more resilient towards such threats. In democracy, this is one of the most vulnerable elements. This is the Achilles tendon of, and, the, and the, that's confidence and trust in uh, electoral systems. If that is compromised, then, um, uh, of course, uh, democracy can be compromised. This is not true for author authoritarian countries, of course. Uh, Russia knows that, and it knows where the most vulnerable, vulnerable systems points of our systems are, especially the new, new latest ones, the, um, political debate, political communication, and at the end of that path, a political campaign. We need to be aware of that, despite the fact that so far we have not yet seen such experiences directly, but we've been watching other, um, and we know that it's quite serious. Madam Minister, we also have another power an important power, I'm talking about China. Let me mention the issue that is now gaining momentum. I'm talking about Huawei company. This Chinese giant is suspected by different parties of uh, spying. Let me go back to the issue mentioned, the issues mentioned by Minister Szymański. I was interested to hear, and I would like to hear that, and I want to refer to that because I believe that we still have some time. So let me refer to what has been mentioned. He mentioned NATO. We are fully involved hand in hand in, with our American allies in Syria, especially. There were suspicions of uh, producing chemical weapons there, free states, United States, the United Kingdom and France undertook the bombing. They not only showed will, but they also had capacity to do so. As for the protection of the Baltic states from the Russian threat, France as well is constantly present there in the Baltic states. And this is a novelty, probably 10 or 15 years ago, probably France wouldn't have taken such decisions. So something is happening in Europe, for sure, as for the estimation of risks. French uh, are present in Tallinn. Uh, Estonians are also um, fighting uh, or present hand in hand with the French soldiers. So what I mean is that European states very often uh, assess the situation in a similar way. 
this is also in line with the with strengthening of the European pillar of the of the NATO and with the European autonomy. We sometimes hear some weird uh, statements uh, coming from the Washington as for the NATO and its role. We hear distancing uh, from the NATO. We want the treaty, the transatlantic treaty, to be a priority organization for both sides. Turkey, as a member state of NATO, is more willing to dialogue with Russia on the Syrian issue than uh, to be uh, faithful to the NATO states, other NATO states. It, this raises some doubts and que questions as for today, their, their intentions. That's why strengthening European defense is, becomes a necessity. When it comes to the structural uh, cooperation, constant cooperation in Europe, this is important because of the need to create a strong pillar, European pillar for the NATO. Nobody will do it instead of us, for us. You mentioned protection or protecting the digital uh, sphere. We are attacked from uh, outside. Those attacks uh, come from different uh, organisms, sometimes state-related. So that's why we have to strengthen our resistance to this uh, phenomenon. This is a domain where we have to make progress, where we have to head to the excellence. In France, we have a security agency dedicated to this uh, digital sphere which is willing to cooperate with similar agencies in other states in order to be prepared as much as possible to exchange, to exchange the um, experience. Maybe the time has not come yet, but uh, this uh, digital security has to be assured. Maybe not yet by the European, uh, at the European level, let's start with national levels and let's develop in this regard. As for China and the Huawei suspicion, let me uh, reinstate what I said um, before. World actors, uh, there, are, there are many uh, actors having this world uh, presence, and China is one of them. Talking with China, we can't do it on our own, each state on their own. At the trade level, these relations are um, regulated by the uh, EU level, and in other domains as well, we should act as Europe at, at the European level. For example, in the domains such as the artificial intelligence, we could invest more as the European Union at the European level than uh, to rather than to be satisfied with the national level. As for the uh, power uh, batteries for, for vehicles, we cannot be satisfied with external um, suppliers. We can mention here this Franco-German initiative, which wants, which wants to solve this problem, to supply those batteries. As for the suppliers, such as China, in order to be able to tackle the, co the competition of those giants, also the giants of the internet, who sometimes act as states, the only operational level that is reasonable is the European level, EU level. Tackling those problems on the national level always makes us we a weaker party. That's why we are very interested in observing uh, the initiatives like the Silk Route. I know that some countries in Europe are very much interested into it. But what is important, this has to be a two-way road. The, 
the steps that we are making to China to the Chinese have to be have to be re returned. We also uh, will have a Q and A session. We are now closing the debate sh uh, shortly. But uh, before we close it, I want to ask you about the European values, your concept of the European values, of the patriotism, sovereignty, identity. Are there any points that we have in common or are there any di di divergences between Poland and France? When I'm in Poland or in any other country in Europe, I often uh, hear that this two-speed um, Europe is a threat. It is as uh, th those other countries are to be put aside. I understand those fears. There are some choices already as the Schengen zone. Not all countries are included and or the Eurozone. It can be an example of uh, those um, a limited club. So for the future, we have to act in such a way not to be blocked by others. There are some areas which cannot be um, addressed uh, in this way, this one of these issues, these are values. European Union, it is not only the common market, the single market. This is this, the community of values, first of all. The values that created Europe, the countries that created Europe want to, to put an end to the cruelty of the World War II. Poland knows what I'm talking about, what I mean as the country who suffered most. So this European construction is based on the common foundation of common values. The European unification and unity was also built on them. Countries such as Poland or, or Hungary did not join the market. They didn't think only about joining a common market. You wanted, those countries wanted to go back to the values that you were separated from for many decennies. These are exactly the reasons why new countries want to join the Union. People even risk their lives to join those values, value of liberty, democracy, and the rule of law. This is something that unites us. This is something that is written in the treaties. Uh, in the uh, European Convention on, H on Human Rights, this is the foundation that we want to build our common house on. And these are values that are non-negotiable. These are not uh, some elements of decoration, some elements that can be neglected or omitted. As uh, Minister Szymański said, this is not just one of many subjects. The European Commission is the guardian of those basic values, especially the rule of law, the cooperation uh, of the police, of the justice system in Europe, the arrest warrant, all those elements are built on trust, on mutual, mutual trust. And this is relevant to every country. We have those European semesters when we look in detail on our budgetary engagements. On the same way, we could probably review the compliance with the rule of law uh, of all the countries, European countries to see whether we are all complying. There is room for improvement in any state. Probably we could see that France, for example, is to be sanctioned because our prisons are uh, overcrowded. And we couldn't argue that it was a mistake to, to sanction us. Uh, we have to develop. Uh, there, there, are, there is room for improvement in many countries, like patriotism, another value, the love for the country, for your own country. 
and as opposite to it, nationalism, that is hostility to the, to the others. I believe in the patriotism and I don't trust nationalism. Francois Hollande once mentioned that, saying that nationalism is univoc to, it means war. Sovereignty, you mentioned sovereignty, national sovereignty has a, a basic meaning. Sovereignty, we can see it as a national sovereignty or European sovereignty, sovereignty of the community. Is it replacing the national sovereignty? I don't believe so. I think that they are complementary one to another. For those who are in the Eurozone, they share common currency, which makes the trade easier, which makes the economies more stable. This is an asset, but this currency is not sovereign enough when the one country put sanctions outside the territories. They can do it because euro is not strong enough. So we have to strengthen this currency as something that is complementary to the national sovereignty. You mentioned also identity. The motto of the European Union is uh, united in diversity. I spent 20 years outside of Union. I was a diplomat outside uh, Europe. And this was the time when I felt European more than ever, when I lived outside of, the, of Europe. To feel as a European means sharing all the civilizational transformations and the changes like Roman and Greek um, civilization, the beliefs and religions the reforms, uh, enlightenment, romanticism, we know that the best way to discuss with uh, Conrad is to say whether one or another celebrity, like Chopin, for example, whether he was Polish or French, and he was both. So this identity of Europe uh, is made by the openness to other people's opinions, other influences, in order to be able to uh, spread them in the world. Thank you very much, Minister. I hope uh, we are now more uh, equal, uh, equally sharing the time and the, at the microphone. Minister, can you sum up? You will be wrapping up the... Uh European future. This is a topic for a long seminar and I think quite an interesting one for me. Uh, but uh, just to remark the main references here, this is what I'd say. The values that are expressed in the European treaties are in an obvious way the values not just of the Polish constitution, that, that would be a, a very formal attitude, but they are Polish values. Poland not only uh, joined the treaty but was the co-author of it, so um, there are no controversies on that level between us. There are controversies, however, uh, pertaining to the fact how we understand these various and how we implement them. And uh, this is something that will remain for, with us forever, because in specific uh, EU member states, when we look at how Usually, the constitutional courts or perhaps international tribunals are coping with uh, trying to define the right balance between uh, the uh, individual liberty and equality, uh, the accessibility of uh, public services and competition. Those are metapolitical notions which are at the heart of the attention of uh, large volumes of case law of various uh, case, uh, constitutional laws and uh, European courts. And this will never end because Europe has the common denominator of uh, 
of uh, values, and it has had it for a much longer period than the duration of the Roman treaties. This choice has always been the same. It has always been, for sure, similar, but it has never been homogenous. It has uh, grown uh, using various streams, and this will also remain with us forever because Europe will never be a place where such homogeneity will be able to be attained, not just because it is contrary to, to our nature, but it is also contrary to our historical memory. So, briefly speaking, Europe is a lot ancient than the European Union, a lot more ancient, and for that reason, this variety will remain with us. And I think this variety needs to be managed skillfully. It needs to have its boundaries somewhere, and the question remains, who should be in charge of that? Can we just uh, end with... Uh, a spectacular phrase saying that in terms of values, there are no, no negotiations, they're non-negotiable. Should we go a step further? I could perhaps agree with the first statement. No one is trying to negotiate with us, with Europe, that uh, people just choose differently sometimes. But I would uh, throw this question. Are there any boundaries of how uh, these values can be politically interpreted? Who is entitled to do that? And where should we put the boundaries so that we do not have to forsake our shared inheritance um, uh, to some political interpretation? I think that there are such problems somewhere in the background. Now, when it comes to sovereignty, indeed, Paris, quite recently, uh, has been promoting the notion of uh, European sovereignty by trying to demonstrate that uh, Europe Europe should be uh, empowered in many uh, areas so that it, uh, we can feel more secure, all of us. Uh, but what escapes us very often is something that concerns me a lot more. Where does Europe's strength come from? Where does European Union's strength come from? Probably, from, from my, in my opinion, not just in, from the point of view of uh, legitimization, but also from a purely political point of view, we must say that there isn't a strong EU without strong states. This might be a temptation, but it is impossible to build a strong and effective European Union at the cost of its states. Of course, to build a strong uh, EU um, based on strong states is not an easy thing because those strong states will be um, elbowing their way forwards. That's a natural practice, but we are not comfortable escaping this um, this divergence here. We can uh, put all our efforts at stake to build a e an EU that is founded on strong EUs, not against them, because if anyone were to uh, Re, um, retrack uh, the EU and its history and try and build the European integration at the co at the expense of the pay of the countries, then the integration concept will be sooner or later rejected. There is no place in Europe for a political space, even such an unprecedented one as the EU is, if such uh, an integration is is. is directed at uh, values uh, or, or is targeting values that have been with us for over a millennium. If we have not separated from these values for for, for millennium or so, we will never do that. We just need to organize them way, those efforts well and orchestrate them and, and direct them to the right uh, goals. And we can do that. This is what we do on an everyday basis in politics. But this may work. But, but building an EU against uh, the states and at their expense will never work. And that's important today because uh, the temptation, uh, I think, uh, is still somewhere there. Many thanks, um, Mr. Konrad Szymański, the Minister for European Affairs. And I think this, will, well, this is where we will wrap up this part of the meeting. I will not make any conclusions. Perhaps uh, they will be visible after the Euro Parliament elections and perhaps even later. Just one reminder here. Back in the 90s, quite a while ago, uh, the Eurovision Festival was won by an Italian song. We have not spoken about Italy today. Uh, other uh, trends become popular. Tutto Cutogno sang that song. Uh, insieme, unite, unite, unite Europe. Perhaps let's uh, 
let's use that as a small reminder and the conclusion for today. And right now, uh, we will have a question and ask answer session. You can do it in Polish, in French, or in English. The floor is open. We will start from the left. Thank you very much for this presentation, for the presentations. I would like to address my question to Minister Szymański. You mentioned the importance of retaking the control over Europe. I think that you have particularly, you are right. You couldn't be more right than you are. So I have a following question. Is, would Poland support pan-European elections, full uh, elections for an purely in, independent uh, commission which would not have more legi leg which would have more leg legitimization coming directly being elected directly by Europeans by citizens when I spoke about uh, the need to reinstate the feeling of being in control a lot of notions are subjective in politics so let's focus on the feeling of being in control which I think should be grounded in reality in control in actual realistic control what I meant by that was uh, the mechanisms that would allow national democracies that today are the only living democracies uh, apart from the uh, ones that are local and on a small scale scale so if we need to allow national democracies to effectively express uh, the uh, wishes of the nations. And the pan-European uh, elections are completely opposing that idea. Pan-European elections would mean that even more voters would not know why uh, X or Y person is the president of the commission, just as it is now. Today, we can at least explain that this is part of um, of, a, of a trade off between the parliament and uh, and the the state that this is a bargaining tool um, the feeling of control in Europe uh, comes from the fact that on a pan european level it is very difficult to grasp what the connection is between voting for party x and being member of any part uh, and any uh, european body of a person y and the beautiful beauty of democracy is lies in its simplicity you vote for a party and then you get a prime minister from that party and you feel like you're in control because you've made a choice half of the people will be happy half of the people will not be happy but at least they know where this person comes from a pan-european election would uh, bring us to a place where we would know even less about why this or that person uh, has this or that seat someone in the middle in the room of the room probably Good afternoon. My name is Paul. I come from France. Thank you for your presentation. M Madam Minister, you mentioned about the uh, about the social um, uh, social justice, and Mr. Minister said about the cohesion. As for the discrepancies, both between European parties or within a country, a state, because this is a very uh, question very much debated in France. Uh, Madam Minister, how do you see the role of Europe and what role can Europe play in this regard? Thank you very much for this question. Let us remember that Europe is not a place where those discrepancies are the smallest. This is true for France. Although we are a country uh, of egality, but we are also very demanding. We expect a lot of this egality from different reasons. But let us not forget that Europe is this part of the world where those inequalities are the smallest, in fact, inequalities. And we also introduced uh, mechanisms to fight those inequalities that are to strengthen those weaker or less affluent countries to catch up, to become more, uh, to become richer. Uh, this is this famous poli uh, policy of cohesion that Poland is so much attached to. Uh, also, this is the field where Poland showed their effectiveness, I, uh, which shows its effectiveness. I mentioned that Poland of 2019 is not similar to 2004. This is just because of the cohesion policy. 
Um, is this enough to have this kind of policy? For sure not. It's not enough. There are other mechanisms that are not so uh, well known and not uh, quite enough emphasized. As, uh, for example, the fact that we have in the European budget this European cohesion fund, uh, the fund strength, uh, supporting the weakest makes us uh, uh, it makes it possible to to uh, support the weakest and the the, the poorest people. Forty percent of uh, uh, the institution in France, which feeds the um, the poor, is uh, it comes from European Union. So if we call uh, France ultra liberal, uh, we are not as much right. It's much more nuanced than that. But we have not. We can't forget that any European states can uh, face those inequalities within regions. We have. Uh, even within rich regions, we have those zones of poverty or of uh, unemployment, higher unemployment. We often mention this criterion of social uh, equality, which is not very uh, clear, not always. We have to include other criteria like, for example, digital reach. And here, this discrepancy in Europe really exists. We have to have more criteria of this kind in order to remember that in a situation where the crisis of 2008 is already over, we still have this feeling in France and uh, in other European countries alike that we still need more, that we need more mechanisms to reduce those inequalities, like, for example, uh, fiscal convergence. Um, we sometimes compete one with another. We uh, use uh, social dumping or uh, fiscal dumping. One consequence of this kind of uh, um, competition is that it makes us weaker uh, when we face the competition from outside. That's why we have to foster uh, the mechanisms that increase this cohesion, both uh, social and fiscal, to be more, um, to have more solidarity in the, within the European Union. Good evening. My name is Yasmin. I come from Alger Algeria. Uh, Madam Minister, a question about Brexit and the European construction. You often uh, repeat that the European construction happened or was based on the um, painful past, on the foundation of the painful past. When the, Euro when the European Union, uh, when the United Kingdom leaves the Union, or is it going to weaken this construction or maybe make it collapse even? Brexit is not a good solution for anyone. If uh, someone would uh, say the opposite, they wouldn't be honest. From the perspective of the 27 member states, it is not a good thing. Maybe Britons would um, say uh, that it's a good idea, but from our perspective, it's not a good idea. On the other hand, we have to work on relations with the, Euro with the UK after their withdrawal. Those relations will be less advanced than today, for sure. If somebody would say the opposite, it would be a lie. We have to take care to have those relations as good as possible, but still they will be weaker than they are now. Your question makes us realize that those who voted for Brexit in 2016, they argued that the United Kingdom should leave the Union and that the United uh, that the European Union should uh, be uh, should collapse, and they uh, voted for both. We managed to strengthen ourselves and to protect ourselves from the second. Uh, the Brexit is on, but the other 27 remains united, or maybe even is more united than ever. This came as a surprise be for the uh, Brexit advocates, 
United Kingdom had to negotiate with the 27, with 27 United States, united not against the UK, but united in those negotiations. And this unity, we maintained it. We managed to maintain it to this date. So although Brexit is a fact, the European Union is not paralyzed about it. We act, we carry on. We deliver our priorities. We strengthen the defense uh, cooperation. Maybe because the UK started to withdraw, we managed to solve even more issues than we would have. Now we are debating on a way to regulate this digital cooperation. We are, um, I'm, I'm talking about the GDPR, the author's rights protection. And the cyber security, uh, also taxing the internet giants uh, here, United uh, United Kingdom and the European Union have the single uh, stake. There are a lot of challenges ahead of us. Still, I cannot say that. Uh, there are no places in Europe that would vote for leaving um, the Euro European Union. Let's mention the movement of five stars in Italy. There were some doubts concerning their presence in the European Union, but when they took power, nobody says any longer that Italy is eager to leave the Eurozone or the European Union. So it seems that the advocates of Brexit paradoxically strengthened the reasons for the others to uh, take joy of belonging to the European Union. Łukasz Jurczyszyn from the Polish Institute of International Affairs Ministers. I would like to thank you for your speeches. They were very informative, and they also were a proof of some productive and friendly uh, attitude in our bilateral relations. My question is addressed to both ministers. And the question is about this idea of relaunching this Weimar Triangle. Uh, you said that, Minister, you said, Madam Minister, you said that you are interested in um, relaunching it, but it has to be based on um, uh, some substantial uh, content. What do you mean by this substantial content? What is the priority content? The same question for Mr. Minister. I will quickly respond to um, then let, give the floor over to Conrad. First of all, the relations of the uh, Weimar Triangle are for real. It's not just a word. Uh, what the ministers of foreign affairs in Poland, Germany, and France have said. They have reunited in this format uh, of the triangle, Weimar Triangle. I had no doubt as to whether on this uh, level we could discuss big topics that it are of interest to us. So we were sure of that. The uh, ministers of uh, foreign affairs have also spoken, the French minister, to his Polish counterpart. Uh, we are not going to summon uh, heads of state every do day. We want to attain a, a result that is deliverable, as diplomats say, but that is something substantial. So why not uh, revisit uh, such discussions instead of making a summit, uh, a decorative summit, just for the sake of taking the photo? There are a lot of top people who are travel across the Europe to just take, have a photo taken with one another. Uh, I have heard from uh, one of the op populist leaders who said that he likes to have photo opportunities. But there are 
uh, many differences, many divergences between them. And I uh, am in favor, and um, Prime Minister Macron is in favor, President Ma Macron is in favor of uh, uh, relaunching th those formats and seeing what may happen uh, following that. Yes, definitely. I think that uh, meetings on the highest levels, especially between leaders of states that have a long tradition of cooperation with one another, may not be decorative. They need to have content. They need to be about something. The public opinion in our nations deserve to have serious talks about serious issues. This will be possible if we all take a serious look at the question of what we are expecting from one another. What we may do together under the European EU, uh, European Union flag, because the majority of such um, tasks is tackled on the European Union level, but and what we cannot do together, and there's nothing scandalous about that. Uh, we can't always do everything together. We can't always use all the instruments and measures and approve them as uh, shared measures for all of us. My position is that even with such a nervous atmosphere that accompanies the change of power, at least in Warsaw and in Paris, because this was quite a dynamic and major change, in fact, and then done in, and then quite a lot of turbulence, all these three uh, capitals have a lot more in common than um, than differences between them. We live in the world where we mostly demonstrate phenomena via the differences. That why, that's why our heads are full of uh, examples of uh, differences. But in all these areas, even migration that has brought about a lot of bitter words in all the three from all the three counterparts, we have a lot more common initiatives and we are doing a lot more together than separately. What are the obvious elements that would definitely not be possible to advance between uh, an understanding between Warsaw, Berlin, Berlin, Paris, and Paris, and uh, Warsaw are the future of the market, the future of the European Union and common market, the fin finance uh, market, and coordination instruments. Uh, and the most important thing, the future of the European Union the scenario for the closest future of the Union will not be written by any of these capitals uh, in separation. It will be written once uh, the right understanding is reached between at least those three uh, capitals and at the end of the day all the capitals. And I think these three capitals have those points of view to offer to one another that are key from the point of view of the ar EU architecture. Before enlargement, this architecture was based on north and south for a very long time. And also, uh, historically, there is a division between uh, the north and the south, and those tensions are not a coincidence. Uh, ever since the enlargement, we've been observing a very slow uh, project of empowering Central Europe in the European uh, construct. This cannot be just done by signing a treaty. These are um, political and psychological processes. Uh, Germany and France uh, have uh, got a 50-year history of learning from one another and strengthening uh, political cooperation um, unrestrained by communist uh, occupation, which happened in Central Europe. So it's no surprise that they're much closer to one another. The enlargement process in 2004 was formally concluded, but as a matter of fact, it is still being completed and finalized as we speak, as a Central Europe is uh, and being empowered. Those three dimensions are necessary, uh, but not sufficient for EU to go ahead and start uh, overpowering its difficulties. We understand the limitations that have happened, but we are ready to overcome them. And I think that today's talks were just a, a small token uh, of contribution to make sure that we can overcome these limitations. Many thanks, um, Minister. Um, I am sad to uh, have to notify everyone that the Q&A session is now closed because we are pressed for time. Madam Minister has another uh, meeting with the French community, uh, and it's quite uh, significant in the framework 
of the national debate. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Madam Natalie Oiseau. Thank you, uh, Minister Konrad Szymański. And I would like to thank everybody for such a great turnout. And now uh, there will be a press conference in the fire. Thank you very much. Good night.